So the 41st edition of the Vancouver International Film Festival just happened from the 29th of September until the 9th of October, and in this time, I was able to watch 15 movies. First of all, I would like to begin by thanking Viv for inviting us to cover the Vancouver International Film Festival as members of the press. It was an amazing experience. We had a lot of fun, and from the bottom of my heart, I just want to let you know that I really, really appreciate it. And just so you know, this is actually the first part of everything I watched at Viv. Future parts will be posted on our YouTube channel really soon. And if they have been posted already, click on this playlist right here to watch all parts. Now, that being said, it is time we start talking about the movies that I saw at this year's festival, starting with the first one, Rabia Kurnas vs. George W. Bush. So when it comes to Ravija Kurnath vs. George W. Bush, I am kind of cheating because I technically didn't watch this film during the festival. Instead, I watched it on August 19 at a surprise screening that Viv held for members. Uh, so yeah, I watched this film months ago, but it did play during the festival, so I am including it. So this movie, Rabija Kurnas vs. George W. Bush, it follows Rabija Kurnas, a Turkish housewife from Bremen, Germany, as she discovers that her eldest son, Murat, was detained in Pakistan by the United States government and is currently being held in Guantanamo-based detention camp. This is a German film directed by Andres Dresen. It is based on a real-life story, and I thought it was extremely mediocre. The performances are strong, it is competently made from a technical perspective, and the real-life story that the movie is based on is clearly very interesting. That said, I thought this movie was an absolute tonal mess. Even though this film explores some incredibly heavy topics, you know, these are topics such as racial profiling, torture, and the inhuman treatment of prisoners, even though this film tackles all of those subjects, it still insists in being a comedy, and it just doesn't work. This film's tone is all over the place, and not in a good way. You know, in one scene, the film wants you to feel disturbed by what is going on with the prisoners in Guantanamo Bay prison, but in the very next scene, the film wants you to laugh at a stupid, bottom-of-the-barrel joke that, if I'm being honest, doesn't land. So yeah, in my opinion, it was a huge mistake to tell this movie as a comedy, and if I were to give it a score in between 1 to 10, I would give it a 5 out of 10, which means I thought it was meh. Now, in the first day of the film festival, which was September 29th, I watched one movie, which was Bones of Crows. This was actually the movie that opened the entire festival, and we actually got invited to cover the red carpet premiere for this film. If you guys are interested in checking out our red carpet coverage, you know, go to our YouTube channel, watch the video right now. We even got the chance to interview the film's director, Marie Clements. Bones of Crows is a psychological drama told through the eyes of Cree matriarch Aline Spears as she survives Canada's residential school system to continue her family's generational fight in the face of systemic starvation, racism, and sexual abuse. This is a Canadian film directed by Marie Clements. It is inspired by true events, and I thought this movie was good. Not bad, not mediocre, but not great either. I thought it was good. The story that the movie tells is extremely important. The film has some very powerful and emotional moments, and on top of that, the film does a great job of raising awareness of the residential school system and everything that happened here in Canada. That said, I thought some of the lines of dialogue were a bit too heavy-handed, and in all honesty, I thought the story was extremely messy. You know, the film is trying to tell six different stories at the same time, and I don't really know if that approach worked. At the very end, the film is sort of able to tie all those stories up in a satisfying way, but for the first two acts, I just felt this film was extremely unfocused and extremely messy. Considering that, if I were to give Bones of Crows a score in between 1 to 10, I would give it a 6 out of 10, which means I thought it was good. Now, on September 30th, I watched two movies, and the first one of those films was Empire of Light. According to the synopsis, Empire of Light is a drama about the power of human connection during turbulent times, set in an English coastal town in the early 1980s. This movie was written and directed by Sam Mendes, who directed some amazing films such as American Beauty, Skyfall, and 1917, it has cinematography by the great Roger Deakins, who, in my opinion, is one of the best directors of photography of all time. And it also has music by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, who won Oscars for their work in The Social Network and Soul. This movie should have been an absolute slam dunk. That said, if I'm being completely honest, I thought Empire of Light was one of the most disappointing movies of the entire year. The story is bland, the characters are bland, the messages are extremely trite and cliche, and everything about it just honestly felt uninspired. And what frustrates me the most is that this is a movie about the power of cinema. I love movies. I believe wholeheartedly in the power of cinema. I should have loved this film. That said, 
If I'm being honest, it just left me feeling a bit cold. Now, even though I clearly wasn't that impressed with this movie, there is one thing that I do have to highlight, because there is one single element in this film that is truly, truly exceptional. And that is, without a doubt, Olivia Colman's performance. Olivia Colman is an incredible actress. She is so, so talented, and she has given some amazing performances in the past couple of years. That said, even though she has done some great work, this, her performance in Empire of Light, is some of her finest work. And honestly, it's kind of a shame that such a great performance is hidden in this pile of mediocrity. But yeah, when it comes to my thoughts of Empire of Light, if I were to give it a score in between 1 to 10, I would give it a 6 out of 10, just simply because of Olivia Colman's performance. It is so good that it manages to bring this film's score into the positive, but just barely. Now, the second movie that I watched on the 30th was Decision to Leave. Decision to Leave is a romantic suspense thriller that revolves around a detective case, but one that is more interested in its characters than in its story's revelations. This is a South Korean film directed by Park Chan-wook, and I was extremely excited for this movie. And the main reason why I was so excited is because I am a huge Park Chan-wook fan. For those of you who don't know, Park Chan-wook has directed absolute masterpieces such as Old Boy and The Handmaiden. If you haven't watched those films, definitely check those out. But yeah, anyways, I love Park Chan-wook, I love his body of work, and I was extremely excited for this movie. And I am very happy to say that Decision to Leave did not disappoint. I thought this movie was absolutely amazing. Now, one of the things that I love the most about this movie is that it is without a doubt a neo-noir. And what I mean by that is that this film in some ways resembles the classic film noirs from the golden age of Hollywood. The plot is intentionally convoluted and at times difficult to follow. There is a femme fatale, which means, you know, a female character who seduces the protagonist and who also might be dangerous. And there is also this fatalistic aura that surrounds the entire film and makes it so much more intriguing. Now, by far my favorite thing of Decision to Leave is without a doubt the symbolism. Because this movie is oozing with symbolism and subtext. There are so many symbols that in all honesty I haven't been able to stop thinking about this film since I watched it. There are many symbols that I think I understand, or at least I hope I do, but there are many more that I still haven't been able to decipher. And that really, really intrigues me. Now, if I were to point just two symbols out, I would say that the most significant symbols in this film are mountains and the sea. Of course, I'm not going to spoil anything. I'm not going to let you know what I think the mountains and the sea symbolize in this movie. But just know that mountains and the sea are featured frequently throughout Decision to Leave. You know, not only do we have many shots in mountains and the sea, but also characters are constantly talking about whether they prefer one over the other. One of the final images of the entire movie is literally a representation of the union in between the mountains and the sea. And one of the posters of the movie literally shows our characters standing between mountains and the sea. So in conclusion, Decision to Leave had some incredible performances and some of the craziest cinematography and editing I've seen all year. If I were to give this film a score in between 1 to 10, I would give it a 9 out of 10 because I thought this movie was absolutely amazing. And that is it for part 1 of everything I watched at VIF. Keep an eye out on our YouTube channel for all future parts or click on this playlist right here. Yeah. <laughs>